You will hear two students talking about university clubs and societies. First, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 1 to 7. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, are you the person to ask about joining a club? Yes, I am. What would you like to know? Well, I'm interested in several things, but I'd like to know more about the different clubs and how much they cost. I'm looking for a small club that's not too expensive. OK. Have a look at this table. You can see the names of the clubs, the fees, and the number of members. I'm afraid they aren't in any order. If you look at the top of the list, the first club is table tennis. That's one of our new clubs. Oh, right. So the table tennis club costs £20. That's quite expensive. Yes, it is a bit expensive. The cross country cycling club is cheaper, though. Membership fees are only £15, but on the other hand, It's got a hundred members. The film and drama club costs a lot, doesn't it? Yes. Fifty pounds is a lot. And that's probably why it only has twelve members. Ah,、uh, is there any other club you think looks interesting? Look at the next one street dance. Have you ever done any street dance? No, I haven't really. It's the cheapest. It only costs five pounds. Mmm. Okay. Shall we start with your interests? What do you like doing best?、Um, well, I like photography. I've got a professional camera, so I take it quite seriously. But I can't really imagine belonging to a club to take photographs. I usually go on long walks on my own and take photos. So I like photography, but I wouldn't want to join a club to do it. OK. a y So what else do you like doing? Running? Oh no, not running. I like walking, but I hate running. I'm afraid the running club isn't for me, or the cycling club. And film and drama? Ah,、uh, no. It's far too expensive. But I do like yoga. I've practiced yoga on and off for years. How many members does the yoga club have? It's always a small group. A lot of people sign up at the beginning of term, but they stop going after a few weeks. So they're left with a few regular members every year. That sounds good. I think I'd like to join the yoga club. And what about the contemporary dance club? Is it expensive? Contemporary dance? No. It's not expensive. Ten pounds for the term. Do you like dance? Well, I've never tried contemporary dance. But I do like jazz and tap dance. How often does the group meet? Before you hear the rest of the conversation, in the exam, you will have 20 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. Listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So, can I have your full name, please? Victoria Mandeville. M A N D A V I L? No, no. M A N D E V I L L E. Double L E. Thank you. And how old are you? 19. And your address? 57. Berry Gardens, Atherton Park, Manchester, M46. How do you spell berry? B E R R Y? No, it's B U R Y. Right, B U R Y. And do you have a contact number? Yes, 
My mobile is zero seven nine four two five seven three two seven nine. Oh seven nine four two five seven three two seven nine. Yes, that's right. Is that all? Uh, one more thing. Do you have an email address? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the Scottish Highlands. First, you have thirty seconds to look at questions eleven to eighteen. Today I have with me Moira McKenzie, the author of several books in a well-known series of travel guides, and she'll be talking about what is probably the most fascinating wildlife area in Europe, the Scottish Highlands. Moira. Yes, that's right, and it's a wonderful place to visit with lots to do in an area that makes up over half of Scotland, including the seven hundred and ninety islands that lie scattered around the coast. It covers thirty-nine thousand square kilometers. Getting there is easy. From here in Glasgow, a good starting point is Fort William on the west coast, with regular bus and rail services linking the two. I'd recommend the train, which takes four hours to get there. Alternatively, you can take the Highland Line, which takes the more easterly route up to Inverness. That, in fact, is a bit quicker, taking around three and a half hours to cover the two hundred and eighty kilometers from here. There are also two main options by road. You can take either the A9 up through Stirling and Perth, and then on to Inverness, or else on the west there's the A82, which runs up to Fort William, and then, if you want, on to Inverness. Now, a lot of people associate the Highlands with bitterly cold weather, but in fact, the region has a generally mild climate, as a result of being surrounded on three sides by sea, particularly the warm waters of the Atlantic. At sea level in the west, for instance, the temperature ranges on average from a minimum of one degree centigrade in January up to eighteen in July, and you can actually see palm trees growing there. Obviously, though the temperatures will be lower inland and on higher ground, you can expect it to rain a lot too, particularly in the west, where annually as much as two thousand millimeters regularly falls. Though this helps account for the rich variety of vegetation and wildlife. When you get there, you'll find there are plenty of reasonably priced places to stay. In Fort William, for instance, you can find a room for the night in a small hotel or a bed and breakfast for just twenty-five pounds, or for twenty-eight to thirty pounds in Inverness. It's probably a good idea to book ahead, though, especially in the summer months. With all the leisure, sports, and cultural activities on offer, the towns are becoming increasingly popular with visitors. For example, accommodation in Inverness won't be at all easy to find this year around the twenty-third of July, as that's when the local Highland Games will take place. So, if your aim is to see the countryside, it may be best to stay in a small village. Now you have some time to look at questions nineteen and twenty.
As I mentioned, there's a huge range of wildlife in the Highlands, but for those visiting the area, there are some basic ground rules that are essential if we are to protect it. Firstly, you should make every effort not to disturb birds and animals, and one way of doing this is to blend in with your surroundings, for instance by avoiding brightly coloured garments, such as orange anoraks. To see wildlife clearly, it's best to use binoculars, keeping your distance. This is particularly important during the breeding season. Wherever possible, use a hide so that they are less likely to detect your presence. Surprising though it may seem, visitors are advised to use their cars where no purpose-built hides are available, as people are apparently less likely to startle animals if they stay inside their vehicles. You may even find that creatures come up close to where you're parked, in which case, wait until they've gone before you move off. It should really go without saying that it's essential to be as quiet as possible, though sadly, some people need reminding of this. Oh, and one other thing. Wild animals and pets don't mix, so please leave your dog at home or at least somewhere he or she can't chase the wildlife or damage their habitat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi Brad. I was wondering if you have time to answer some of my questions about my upcoming test. Sure, no problem Jeff. What is it that you're having problems on? Well, it's for my English final. We have to prepare a five-minute speech to present in front of the whole class, including the professor. So I'm a little bit worried. Is there any specific topic or can you do it on whatever you want? It has to have something to do with the origins of English literature. I'm thinking of doing it on Shakespeare, but I bet many other students will have the same idea. That's fine. Don't worry if others are doing the same thing. As long as you do a good job, that's all that counts. A good professor will grade all students fairly. You really think so? I suppose Shakespeare is the most famous author, so it should be fine. Besides, Shakespeare has so many works. You only have to choose a couple of them and talk about those. I guess you're right. Do you have any advice about how to prepare a speech? First, you need to select your topic. Have you done this yet? Yes, I have lots of information on Shakespeare. Good. Next, you should do a research on a specific topic. Do you have a deadline for which to turn in your speech topic? The deadline is next Tuesday. So you should have a detailed outline of what you will say by then. Do not just turn in a piece of paper saying Shakespeare on it. That will not give your professor any idea as to what you will be talking about. OK. So you think I should write out an outline of my speech? Of course! Writing your speech out in outline form is essential. No one could give a speech from scratch. Even the president must refer to his outline when giving a speech. An outline will give you a good structure to base your speech on. Now look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen to the tape and answer questions 26 to 30. That's true. I was thinking that I would do an outline last, after I figured everything out. But I think your idea is better. What should I do after I have an outline prepared? You should then write the speech out, word for word, what you're going to say. This is so you'll have a firm idea of what you will say. It doesn't mean that the speech you will give will be exactly the same, but at least you have a fairly good idea what the final product will be. At this point, I can read it over for you if you want. Really? That would be great. I would appreciate that so much. No problem. Once you write it out, the next step is to practice giving the speech. At first, you can do it in front of the mirror so you can see your expressions in your presentation. After that, you should practice giving your speech to some friends. I can listen to it for you too. That's a great idea. I really owe you a big favour then. Sure. You can do my Latin homework for me. Just kidding. Seriously, don't worry about it. I can help you with anything you need. So, when is the speech due? Well, the speech topic is due next Tuesday. The speech itself will be due next Friday. I can help you any time you want because I have no tests this next week. Besides, I'm an English major and Shakespeare is one of my favourite authors, so helping you out will be no big deal. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to the library to get started on all this. I'll call you tomorrow. See you tomorrow then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers fishing crews and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. 
Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer, they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move. Looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today, the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian. Some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29%, and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank、you